What a great way to start off the worship service, amen? At least that way I know that you all can hear me now. I want to welcome you all here this morning. What a wonderful way to start the service this morning. If you're visiting with us, we are especially glad that you're here. We want you to feel welcome here today. And I just pray that you will be blessed as you worship the Lord with us today. I want you to notice that on the back of the pew in front of you, if you're visiting, there are visitors cards and we would love for you to fill one of those out and just drop it in the offering plate today if you have the chance. And that would just let us know that you were here. And if you have any prayer needs or ministry needs, let us know and that way we can know how to better minister to you. And so we're starting off our worship in a special way this morning. If you notice, I'm up here in the baptistry because once again we get to start our service off with the ordinance of baptism today amen <clears throat> when we when we celebrate baptism it's one of the greatest celebrations in the church because we're celebrating what christ has done for us as we celebrate baptism i tell you all this time and time again but it's a beautiful picture of what jesus has done for us in his burial and his resurrection from the dead and it's also a beautiful picture of what christ has done in us because the bible says that we are new creatures in christ and when we are baptized it's a symbol that we are buried to an old life and raised again to walk in the newness of life so today as we celebrate this very special occasion uh, we are going to be baptizing two people today samantha and jibby maddox we are so excited They've been coming here with us for quite some time and um, have discussed with both of them what baptism is about. And both of them want to uh, publicly profess their faith to the church today. So I want to begin by asking Samantha to come out here with me. Samantha and I have talked a lot about baptism. She has come from a very confusing point in her life where she's thought many different things about baptism. Growing up, uh, being taught two completely different extremes on what having a relationship with God was even about. But now she has come to the conclusion that she understands that her relationship with God is by faith in Christ alone. The Lord led her and Jimmy to this church by His providence. And she wants you all to see her get baptized today as she professes her faith in Christ. So Sam, today I would like to baptize you as my sister in Christ in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And all of God's people said, Amen. All right, and now I'd like to invite Jimmy to come in here and stand with me. Jimmy and I have also had the opportunity to talk a lot uh, as I said, he and Samantha both have come to the point where they realized that they needed to be in the church, raising their family in the church, and they both wanted to profess their faith in Christ together before the church today. And so, Jimmy, today, as you stand before this church, I would like to baptize you as my brother in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And all of God's people said, Amen. All right. Thank you, Jimmy. As we continue to worship this morning, I would like to invite you to bow your heads as we go before the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us this special privilege of beginning our worship service today in such a special way to be able to baptize people, to, to baptize Samantha and Jimmy so that they may show this church and the world their love for you. Lord, I pray today that they might be an example of the love that you show your people. And I pray, Lord, that they may for years to come be an example of the love that your people have for you. Lord, it is my prayer today that you do many wonderful things through them in the ministry that you call them to right here at this church. And I pray, Lord, that as we worship you this morning in song and as we get ready to worship you through the preaching of the word, that you will bless us as we come to know you better. Father, we pray that you're honored by this service today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. That'll be the last time, I think. <laughs> Starting in verse 32. 
It says, Now it came to pass, as Peter went through all parts of the country, that he also came down to the saints who dwelled at Lydda. There he found a certain man named Ananias, who had been bedridden eight years and was paralyzed. And Peter said to him, Ananias, Jesus the Christ heals you. Arise and make your bed. Then he arose immediately. So all who dwelt at Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. At Joppa there was a certain disciple named Tabitha, which is translated Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and charitable deeds, which she did. But it happened in those days that she became sick and died. When they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. And since Lydda was near Joppa and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent two men to him, imploring him not to delay in coming to them. Then Peter arose and went with them. When he had come, they brought him to the upper room. And all the widows stood by, by him, weeping, showing the tunics and garments which Dorcas had made while she was with them. But Peter put them all out and knelt down and prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. Then he gave her his hand and lifted her up. And when he, called, when he had called the saints and widows, he presented her alive. And it became known throughout all Joppa, and many believed on the Lord. So it was that he stayed many days in Joppa with Simon a Tanner. Let's pray. Father, we come before you today as your people. And Father, we just ask that as we continue to study through your word, Lord, that you would just speak to us. Uh, Father, that we would come to a better understanding of your greatness, of your glory, of your holiness. Today as we study your word, I pray that your spirit... Uh, would be working uh, through Scott as he speaks. It would be working in this place in our hearts to give us ears to hear this message. Uh, and Father, I pray at the end of the day that all that we do here would exalt you and glorify your name, Father, because that's why we're here. Uh, Father, we thank you, we praise you, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let me begin by just saying how wonderful, what a privilege it is to be here with you all to see you all here today and just for us to worship the Lord together you know sometimes I think that we take it for granted because it's just one of those things that we do but it is a huge privilege for me to be here with you and I pray that it's uh, an honor for us all as we come in here and worship the Lord together amen w what a great day this is starting out to be as we look at the story that Matt just read this morning I want to say something to you that everyone knows, and that is that people are longing to see the healing power of Jesus Christ. Do you know that? People want to see Jesus healing. They want to see the healing power of Jesus in their lives, in the lives of the people around them that they love. Isn't that, isn't that how you pray when your child is sick? Dear Lord, heal my child. You want to see your child healed whenever your loved one is on their deathbed and about to pass away, but you don't want to say goodbye. You say, Lord, heal my husband or heal my wife. And as good Christians, we should always pray that the Lord's will be done, but if we were all going to be honest, much of the time, regardless of what God's will might be, we just ask for healing, don't we? We ask that God heal us from our pain, that God heal us from our sickness, that God heal us from our heartbrokenness, but God, whatever it takes, just heal them. You know, people are desperate to be healed. There are people who are paralyzed and not able to walk that would do anything they could. They pray for healing. Some of the times they go to these service that are unfortunately run by con artists where they tell them if only you will come in here and believe then you will walk again or you will be healed and they are so desperate that they go to things like that they want the healing power of jesus in their life there are people who have been stricken with cancerous tumors and they say god i'm not ready to go yet can you please heal me they want to see the healing power of God and people are desperate to experience it. People in the church want to experience it, but I can't even begin to tell you how desperate the people outside the church are to experience it. 
even if they don't think that they ever will. Now here's the thing. He can do all of that. Amen? He can do all of it. He can make the lame walk again. He can remove tumors. He can give energy to the people who are bedridden and let them walk. There is nothing. There is nothing in the universe that Jesus Christ cannot do. If we long to see the healing power of Jesus, let me begin by saying this. Anything that we want Him to do, He can do. He is equipped to do and He is powerful enough to do. He can do all of it. So the question is, should we expect it? If God is capable of healing even the greatest of our weaknesses or sicknesses, should we expect Him to do so? Because He can, does that mean He should be expected to? Well, in order to answer that question, I want to invite you to look at this story in Acts chapter 9, second half of Acts chapter 9, verses uh, 20, excuse me, verses 32 to 43. And I think that this story is going to answer that question because this is a story of healing. It's a story of the power of healing. And it's a story that will leave us with great expectations of what God is going to do in our lives after we read it. So let me show you what Peter did. This is something that happened in the ministry of Peter. And in case you don't know who Peter is, sometimes we take for granted what the people of the church realize and don't realize. Peter was an apostle of Jesus Christ. An apostle is someone that Jesus has sent out to do His work. He was one of the followers of Jesus Christ. He did not start off strong. He did not start off as a man with great character. Uh, as a matter of fact, he thought that he was a lot stronger than he was. He rebuked Jesus whenever Jesus said that he was going to die on a cross. And Jesus says, get down behind me, Satan. He told Jesus that he would never turn aside from following him. And that very night he denied Jesus three times. But he's also the one that recognized that Jesus is the Christ. He recognized that Jesus is the Messiah that God has sent to save his people. And upon that recognition, Jesus said, I'm going to call you Peter, the rock. And upon this rock, this confession that you, Peter, just made, I am going to build my church. And I want you to know that after Jesus died on the cross and He rose from the dead, and after He ascended back to heaven, He began to do remarkable things through Peter and through the rest of the apostles. As we began the book of Acts, we saw what happened on the day of Pentecost, whenever the Holy Spirit filled the disciples and it filled the church and there were thousands of people that became a part of the church in one day and the Holy Spirit had given God's people power to be witnesses for him Peter was among those people there were threats of physical harm and threats of death but Peter and the other apostles continued to preach the gospel of Jesus they were preaching at the temple and healed a, a paralytic man to show what the power of Jesus could do. And now, people in Jerusalem were being persecuted. They were still believing in Jesus, but they scattered, not so that they could hide from the persecution, but so that they could tell even more people about Jesus. They went into Samaria. Philip began to preach the Gospel, and even outside of Samaria, they are beginning to take the Gospel to the ends of the earth. And this is what we are seeing in the ministry of Peter. I want to point out something to you that God did through him. Actually, two things in this story that God did through Peter that are remarkable in every way. But I want you to understand before we read this story that it was God working through Peter. None of this that I am about to tell you is something that Peter did on his own. None of it is something that Peter had the power to do in and of himself. 
But all of it is God working through Peter. And I'm going to demonstrate to you how I know that as we read this story. But I want you to keep that in your mind as we begin. There are two separate scenarios that we're going to look at in this story. One scenario is what Peter did at a place called Lydda. And the other scenario is what Peter did at a place called Joppa. Many of you have heard of Joppa before. And we're going to talk about what Peter did at each of those two places. And then we're going to ask the question, should we expect to see the healing power of Jesus today? Look at verse 32. It says, It came to pass as Peter went through all the parts of the country that he came down to the saints who dwelt in Lydda. So he went to a place called Lydda. And if you're not familiar with that, Lydda is a small town or was a small town about 25 miles to the west of Jerusalem. It is now a suburb of what is known as Tel Aviv. As a matter of fact, the Tel Aviv airport is right where Lydda was at. And so Lydda is a, a community that's 25 miles away. It's on the outskirts of Jerusalem. And they didn't have the temple in Lydda. They didn't have all of what Jerusalem had. But the gospel message of what Jesus Christ has done is starting to spread. And this is where Peter finds himself. It says in verse 32 that he goes there in order to be with the saints who dwelt there. And again, sometimes I take for granted that, that you all know the words that we use and the words that are in the Bible. And I just feel like I need to make sure you understand what the word saint means. Sometimes people hear saints and they think, of the saints of the Catholic Church, of uh, people who have become a saint after extraordinary acts and, and over a certain period of time. But when the Bible uses the word saint, that's not what it is referring to. The word saint means holy one. It, the, the root of the word saint is the same as the root for the word holy or holiness. So a saint is one who has been made holy, one who is being made holy, and... They are being sanctified. The word sanctified comes from the word saint. So anybody who has a relationship with God based on what Jesus Christ has accomplished for them on the cross is numbered among the saints of God. These are those whom Peter came to see. The Christians the people of the way, the people that were followers and disciples of Jesus, Peter went to see. But when he went to this town called Lydda in order to be among the saints, to pray with them and to worship with them, verse 33 says that he found a certain man named Aeneas. And look at what it says about Aeneas. He had been bedridden for eight years and was paralyzed. So on his trip to visit all of the other Christians in the town, by the providence of God, he somehow runs into or comes across this man. His name is Aeneas. It says he's been paralyzed eight years. Eight years, he can do nothing. Eight years, he is bedridden. Eight years, he is helpless. Eight years, he can do nothing on his own. For eight years, he has depended on the help of other people to do everything for him that has been done for him. For eight years, he has not been able to do anything. And I am sure that for eight years, he probably had been losing hope day by day. And after eight years of being paralyzed, he probably, this is me speculating, but he probably had come to the point where he thought that there would be no healing for him. This was the way that it was going to be. But by the providence of God, here comes Peter as he comes to visit the Christians, the saints of the town of Lydda, that he just happens up Aeneas. And as he was guided by God, I want you to see what Peter said to him. He said, Aeneas, Jesus the Christ 
heals you. Now arise and make your bed. He looks at Aeneas, who he doesn't know from Adam, a man that he's probably never met before this day, but he looks at him and he calls him by his name. He doesn't know what the doctors might say. He doesn't know what happened to cause him to be paralyzed. He doesn't know any of these factors. All he knows is that Aeneas is in bed and he cannot walk. And he looks at him and he says, Jesus, not only Jesus, Jesus the Christ heals you. So what we are seeing Peter do is something that has not been seen elsewhere in the New Testament outside of Jesus himself doing it. Five times in the New Testament, well, excuse me, this is the next scene. Five times in the New Testament we're going to see um, happen what Peter is going to do. But the other three times that had been done before this were by Jesus and Paul would do it one time after this. Peter looks at this man and says, Jesus the Christ heals you. Peter doesn't claim to have the power to heal. Peter doesn't claim to be a miracle worker. He doesn't claim to be a divine healer. Peter looks at the man and taking no credit of his own, he says, you are healed not by me, not by my power, not by my gift, but by the power of Jesus. And in case you're not familiar with who Jesus is, He is Jesus who is the Christ. Jesus. The very name Jesus means Yahweh saves. The Lord saves. He is the one whom the angel told Joseph that would come to save His people from their sins. He's also the one that Peter says is the Christ. He is the long-awaited for King of the Jews, the Messiah that they had been looking for, the Messiah that they had overlooked when He came. But Peter says, if you expect the power of God to heal you, and it has happened, it's not been by my power, but it's been by the power of Jesus who is the Christ, the Messiah that you have been waiting for. This is the Jesus who saves you. This is the Jesus who heals you, Aeneas. He not only is the Messiah of the Jewish people, but He is the God that spoke the world into existence. He is the God that keeps the galaxies in motion. He is the God who has everything under His control. And just in case you thought that He was too busy running the universe, Aeneas, He has taken time out to heal you. And at that point, Peter says to Aeneas, get up and make your bed. Sounds like something that a parent would say to their child. Get up and make your bed. Isn't that funny? After eight years of being bedridden, the very first thing he's told to do is make his bed. But nonetheless, that's what Peter tells him. And he says, get up Aeneas and make your bed. Because you have been healed by the power of Jesus Christ. And look what it says at the end of verse 34. Then he arose. Immediately. Not even the blink of an eye had passed before this man who hadn't been able to lift a finger, or lift a toe, or move his body for eight years jumped up out of his bed. And he did what Peter told him to do. And he did what only someone who had been healed by the power of God would be able to do. And I want you to look at what happened after that. When Peter said, Aeneas, you were healed. Aeneas was healed. He jumped out of bed. And people from all around Lydda saw what happened to Aeneas. And verse 35 says, So all who dwelt at Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. Now Sharon was a, a, a suburb, a town that was right there in the vicinity of Lydda. 
And the people of Lydda saw what happened to Aeneas. The people of Sharon saw what happened to Aeneas. And the church began to grow. People said that Jesus the Christ did that to him. Only Jesus has the power to do that to him. And as the church had begun to grow and blossom in Jerusalem, it is now beginning to grow at Lydda and even the community of Sharon that is next to Lydda. As a matter of fact, it's interesting and uh, the prophet Isaiah, and I'm not going to turn there now because I didn't save it in my Bible, but in Isaiah 35 and in Isaiah chapter 63, Isaiah prophesies that God is going to bless Sharon. That Sharon is going to be a place that God's blessings abound in. Read it yourself. Isaiah 35 verses 1 through 3. Isaiah 6, excuse me. Isaiah, Isaiah 35, verses 1 through 3, and 65, verse 10, not chapter 63. Isaiah prophesies God's abundant blessing on the community of Sharon. And do you know what is happening as Peter has told Aeneas to rise and make his bed? That prophecy is being fulfilled in front of Peter's eyes and in front of all the eyes of the people that are watching. And it says that those people saw Aeneas and they turned to the Lord. When Aeneas was healed, the church grew. When Aeneas was healed, it was a testimony to the power of God in his life. And that is the God that everyone wanted to serve and they turned to the Lord. The, Aeneas, the, the God that had the power to heal Aeneas is the same God that had the power to heal Samantha and Jimmy as they stood before you this morning to recognize His power in their lives. Amen. This is the God that we serve. And this is the God that people saw when Aeneas was healed. And I don't want you to miss that part. When Aeneas was healed, the church began to grow. Meanwhile, God was also working in another community. A place called Joppa. Joppa is uh, 10 miles away from Lydda. So it is... It is just past the outstretches, just off the outskirts of Lydda, 10 miles to the northwest. It also is a suburb of Tel Aviv. Joppa is a coastal town in Israel. Uh, Joppa is mentioned, I think, for the first time, if I'm not mistaken, in the book of Joshua, but, Josh, but Joppa is most widely known by most of us as the place that Jonah fled to to jump on a ship. Whenever the Lord told Jonah, go to Nineveh, Jonah didn't go to Nineveh, he went to Joppa. And it was Joppa that he got on a ship to go as far away from Nineveh as he could possibly be. But those of you who know the story know that God had other plans for Jonah. But this is the Joppa that God is working in. So, as Aeneas is healed, as Peter tells Aeneas to get up and people began to believe in the Lord and the church begins to grow, something is stirring 10 miles to the northwest over in the city of Joppa. And it says in verse 36 that at Joppa there was a certain disciple named Tabitha, which is translated Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and charitable deeds, which she did. So God was already working in Joppa because... They tell us about a woman there that was a woman of God. She was a disciple, a follower of Jesus, and God had already been doing great things through her. Her name was Tabitha. That's the Aramaic or Hebrew name that she had. But translated into Greek, the name was Dorcas. The name Dorcas means gazelle or beautiful. And so she may have been a very beautiful woman to behold. I don't know. But I can promise you one thing. She certainly was beautiful on the inside. Her spirit was full of beauty because she was a disciple of Jesus. It says in verse 36 that she was full of good works and charitable deeds because this 
is what God was doing through her. And as Dorcas was going about her ministry in the town of Joppa, verse 37 says, it happened in those days that she became sick and she died. When they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. And since Lydda was near Joppa and the disciples had heard that Peter was there at Lydda, they sent two men to him, imploring him not to delay in coming to them. So as this disciple of Jesus, this woman named Tabitha, this woman called Dorcas in Greek, had passed away, a great servant and saint of the Lord, one that people looked up to, one that people admired. The people of that town knew that Peter was close. He was in a neighboring community. He was over there at Lydda, at Lydda so they asked him to get there and to get there pronto. To, to make no delays in getting to them. Why did they ask Peter to come? Well, maybe they just wanted Peter to comfort the saints there at Joppa after what happened. Maybe they were expecting a miracle to be worked through Peter because God had already done things through Peter that other men could not do. And I made the mention a moment ago, what Peter does is only done five times in the New Testament. I was actually referring to what he does here with Dorcas. And that is to command her to be raised from the dead. Jesus did it three times. One of those times was Lazarus everyone is familiar with. The fifth time would be by Paul as he told Eutychus to rise from the dead after he fell out of a second story window after listening to a very, very long sermon. So I will try to keep it shorter today so that doesn't happen to any of you. Amen? I will do my best, but I can make no guarantees. But if you do fall over in this sanctuary, we're going to depend on the power of God to take care of you too. That's my promise to you. So Peter comes and they called for him not to make haste in coming. And it says in verse 39 that he arose and he went with these people. And when he had come, they brought him to the upper room where they washed her and her body was lying. And all the widows stood by Peter. They were weeping. They were crying. And they were showing the tunics and the garments that Dorcas had made while she was with them. And it was much like the scene that we would experience when we lose somebody that we love. And we think about all of the good things that they did and we weep because we're not going to see them do those things anymore. We weep because we're going to miss the people that we love. We, miss, we weep because they're not with us and that is what was taking place. This is a testimony to how much the people around Tabitha loved her. This godly woman was loved by the people that were around her. And as they were weeping, Peter told them to leave the room. It was an odd request, but it was one that they listened to. Verse 40 says, Peter put them all out and he knelt down and he prayed. And turning to the body, the dead, lifeless corpse of Tabitha, he looked at her body and said, Tabitha, arise. You know what happened next? The Bible says that she opened her eyes. This dead, lifeless being opened her eyes. And as her eyes opened, and she saw Peter standing before her, the Bible tells us that she sat up and at that moment, verse 41 says that Peter gave her his hand and he lifted her up. And when he had called the saints and the widows that were around, he presented her back to them alive. Can you imagine what the scene must have looked like? They were mourning. They were sad. They were stricken with grief at the one that they loved who had passed away. And as her corpse lay in that room with Peter, Peter comes walking out and she was with him just as alive as she had ever been. Let me tell you, this was not the power of Peter that rose or raised Tabitha from the dead. 
This was the power of God working through Peter. As Jesus the Christ was the one who healed Aeneas through Peter, Jesus the Christ is also the one who speaks through Peter to Tabitha and says, rise from the dead. And she arose from the dead. And now she has presented her, she is presented alive before all of her friends, all of her family, and all of the saints of Joppa so they can see what God has done to her. I want you to see the result in this case as well. Verse 42 says, And it became known throughout all Joppa, and many believed on the Lord. Just as Peter, by the power of God, spoke to Aeneas and watched God heal him, Peter, by the power of God, spoke to Tabitha and watched God raise her from the dead. And just as the result was in Lydda, where Aeneas lived, that the church began to grow, so was the result in Joppa, where Tabitha lived. That after God had raised her from the dead, that the church began to to grow. It became known throughout all of Joppa, and many people believed on the Lord, and once again the church grew. Behold the power of God. In Lydda, they beheld the power of God working in Aeneas. The church grew. And in Joppa, they beheld the power of God working in Tabitha. And the church grew. Now here is the million dollar question. Should we expect God to do the very same thing for us that He did for Aeneas? Should we expect God to do for us what He did for Tabitha? And in a very real way, I can answer you with an emphatic yes. And just in case you're confused by what I mean, I am not a faith healer. I am not a divine healer. I don't claim to have powers or the powers of prediction. And I'm not even going to tell you that God's going to heal your sickness. So how can I say yes? Well, let me first start by saying, not everybody's going to be healed in the same way. But everybody who trusts Him will be healed. God may not remove the tumors from your body. He doesn't do that for everybody. You realize that? God doesn't take everyone that's paralyzed and tell them to get up and walk and watch them walk. That doesn't happen to everyone. And we certainly know that everyone who has died and lies in a coffin has not been spoken to in a way that they can get up and step out of that coffin and walk out of the church. That doesn't happen to everybody. So how can I say with an emphatic yes that God will do for you what He did to Aeneas? And that God will do for you what He did to Tabitha? God may not walk your, He may not make your father walk again. He may not bring your child out of bed. He may not relieve the pain that is in your body. But you must understand that what happened to Aeneas and what happened to Tabitha are a picture of something even greater that God was doing. If you think the miracle was God healing Aeneas or even God raising Tabitha from the dead, then you have missed the true miracle that takes place in this story. The true miracle and the greatest miracle is what happens in verse 35 and what happens in verse 42. Verse 35 says, After Aeneas was healed, people saw him and turned to the Lord. Verse 42 says that after Tabitha was raised from the dead, many people believed on the Lord. Please don't be short-sighted about the power of God. 
What he did in Aeneas was something small compared to what he did in the rest of that community. And that was spiritually bring people to life. People that were walking all over that community that did not know the Lord and were destined for hell. They looked at God's power in Aeneas' life and they said, Lord, I trust You. It's not just that he healed Aeneas. He healed a whole community of people that trusted in him so that they would be with him forever. When he rose Tabitha to life, the biggest miracle that occurred is that many people saw it and they too were healed because they believed in the Lord. The greatest miracle in this story is not what he did for Aeneas and not what he did for Tabitha. It's what he did in the whole community that were surrounding them. Do you realize this morning that saving a sinner is an even greater miracle than making a dead person walk again? There is no greater act of power on God's part, nor is there any other greater act of grace or any other greater act of love on God's part than saving a sinner from hell. Please remember that this morning. We want God to take away our aches and pains. We want God to heal our hearts. We want God to do so many things to relieve the suffering that we endure in this world. But outside of what Jesus did on a cross, standing in our place, in dying for us, we are bound for an eternity of suffering. It's worse than cancer. It's worse than tumors or being paralyzed or any other thing that you can imagine. But God has healed us on the cross of Jesus Christ if only we will trust in Him as our only hope. Saving a sinner is the greatest miracle of all. And this is the purpose for which Jesus died. As He rescued Aeneas and as He rescued Tabitha, He has also come to rescue all who call on His name. And while He may not make you rise up out of a casket, And while He may not make you throw away your crutches, what He will do is rescue you from the greatest misery that you have ever faced. And that's the misery that your sin has caused in your life by separating you from God. Now I want to ask you this morning, as we look at the story of what Peter's ministry held at Lydda and at Joppa, Are you longing to see what these people saw? Are you longing to see the power of Jesus this morning? Do you want to see Jesus put His healing hand on you? Do you want to see the the healing power of Jesus touch someone in your life? You know people that are bedridden. You know people that are sick. You know people that are in anguish. Do you want to see the healing power of Jesus Christ? Well, here is the message that Peter gives to us this morning. Number one, many of you in this room have already trusted Jesus Christ for forgiveness of your sins. Many of you in this room recognize that He is your only hope. Many of you in this room worship Him with your life that doesn't change the fact that you're overwhelmed by your problems. The grief that you feel over losing the person that was closest to you is real. And you're caught up in that. The the pain that you feel in your body when you try to get up every morning is real. The embarrassment that you face from other people because you are a do-gooder or a Christian or whatever you want to call it as a follower of Jesus, it is real. And even though you trust in Him, you're overwhelmed by these problems that plague you. And you're so caught up this morning in the misery of it that you've lost the joy 
of the experience of being rescued by the healing power of Jesus. And this message for you today is to remind you that Jesus has healed you. Jesus, His healing hand has touched your life. And even though you may feel the pain of loss, and even though your body may hurt, and even though you may face shame in the world that we live in for one reason or another, the healing hand of Jesus Christ has come upon you and He has healed you in a greater way than He could by taking away any of those other things. And if you're here today and you've lost your joy because you're overwhelmed with grief or pain or sadness, then remember that Jesus has healed you this morning. Just like He healed Aeneas and just like He healed Tabitha, this message is for you. He has raised you from the dead and He has caused you to walk in the newness of life just like we saw in that baptism this morning. That's what Jesus has done for you. So if you're here today and you're a Christian, but you're overwhelmed by the problems in your life, let this message remind you and let Jesus restore your joy. But finally, there are others in this room today. There are some of you here, and I don't assume because we're in a church that every person in this room has experienced the healing power of Jesus Christ. There are some of you that have never experienced Jesus' healing power. There are some of you who need to experience it and who are longing to experience it and just possibly don't even know how to experience it. You don't need to be healed from sickness. You don't need to be healed from shame, what you need to be healed from is what separates you from God. And the Bible tells us that those who call on the name of Jesus Christ will be saved. That's what I'm asking you to do today. Do you need the healing power of Jesus in your life? Are you longing to see what only He can do? Do you need the greatest miracle ever to take place in you? Then I'm asking you and I'm pleading with you today to call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. You will be healed from the greatest misery that plagues you. And I want you to know that what He did for Aeneas and what He did for Tabitha is nothing compared to what He will do for you. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank You so much for the blessing of Your healing power. Lord, without it, we would have nothing to look forward to. Without Your healing power, we would be lost and never able to heal ourselves. But Lord, You have chosen not only to love us, but You've chosen to save us by sending Your Son to die on a cross in our place. And Lord, we thank You for that this morning. And as we look at the story of what Peter did for Aeneas and what Peter did for Tabitha, Lord, we're reminded of the much greater picture of what You do for all who call on the name of the Lord Jesus. Lord, we sometimes look for the wrong things in our life. And we say, I've called on the name of Jesus and I'm still walking with crutches or sitting in a wheelchair. Or I've called on the name of Jesus and I'm still heartbroken. Or I've called on the name of Jesus and I'm still not expected to live. But Lord, let us be reminded this morning that when we call on the name of Jesus, You give us something much greater than any of those requests. You have given us eternal life in Jesus Christ. You have promised that ultimately, cancer cannot separate us from Your love. Ultimately, being paralyzed cannot separate us from Your love. Ultimately, a bad heart or any other thing that plagues us cannot separate us from Your love because You have guaranteed us eternity in Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray today that the people in this church might experience miracles. Lord, I pray for those in here that need to be reminded of Your love, that are overwhelmed by the very real grief that is in this world, that Your love for them has surpassed 
all of the grief that they are experiencing today. And Lord, I pray for the others in this room today that need to experience Your healing. I pray for those, Lord, that need a miracle in their life that You will do for them in a much greater way than what You did for Aeneas and Tabitha, that You will give them new life. May they not leave this room today, Lord, without experiencing the healing power of Jesus Christ. And it is in His precious name that we pray. Amen. As the Lord speaks to your heart this morning, I want to invite you to respond to the Word of God. Everybody in here this morning should be impacted by this story. Maybe you've trusted Jesus, but your joy needs to be restored because you don't appreciate the gift that He has given you in spite of the pain that is existing in your life. Maybe today is the day that you need to recognize, God, I appreciate what You've done for me through Jesus and I want to see that joy restored as I worship You. Maybe you know somebody else who is going through hard times, who is grief-stricken, who is just very, very sick. Maybe they're praying for the wrong things. And you just need to pray for them that God will restore the joy in their lives so they may be excited about the eternity they have with Him. Or maybe, just maybe, you're here today and you've never experienced the miracle of the healing power of Jesus. Maybe today is the day that Jesus is telling you the same thing that Peter told Tabitha when he said, Get up! Arise! And she did. Maybe Jesus is telling you to do that today as He raises you to a new life. Do not leave this room today without responding to the Word of God. If He is speaking to your heart, listen to Him today. And as the music plays, I want to invite you to respond. Whether you need to pray to Him where you're at, whether you want to come and let me pray with you. But whatever the case is in your life, Please, please, please listen to him today. Mm -hmm.